Okay, I think I think it's twelve. I think we can start uh, so people can uh, join us while while we are at the beginning at the introduction. Um, so welcome everyone. Welcome to the second part of the final Big Data Stack workshop, uh, a Big Data Stack for Industry, a focus on retail shipping and insurance, as what we've seen this this morning. And now it's time uh, for our panel discussion, moderated by Yosef Moati from IBM Research on is big data the real future of emerging business? Now for mm. this discussion panel, we have uh, big data experts invited, Ray Walshi from BDVA, Celine Shu, Tatsu Kuvalati from Kustabar and Satis Pritsus from Deep Sea Technologies. Um, so the session chairs, uh, so that's uh, me, Marik Willems from Research Communications Stakeholder Engagement Specialist at Trust IT Services. We've already presented us uh, at the start, but for those of not being able to join the first part, uh, Andrea Shilacci, Digital Marketing Communication Specialist, Trust IT Services. Hi, Andrea. And Josef Moati, Senior Researcher at IBM Research Haifa, Big Data Stack Coordinator and Data Services Technical Lead. Hi, Josef. So Hi. for um, the uh, part two is uh, structured as follows. Uh, is uh, big data, the real future of emerging business. This introduction will be led by Yusuf, Yusuf Moati. Then we have the discussion panel, and then we have some time for ask me almost anything uh, part where, uh, where you are free to ask any questions uh, you may have. But also let me remind you, as we've, we've discussed this morning, uh, you have the opportunity to put your questions in the Q&A, uh, both on Zoom and on WUVA, okay? So uh, without further ado, Yosef, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can put up the, the slides that you have for this introduction and I'll present you in the meantime. So I'll stop sharing here. Um, so Yosef Mati is a big data set coordinator and technical services lead. He's senior researcher at IBM Research Haifa. His research interests include big data analytics and storage frameworks. And Mati has a doctorate in computer science from telecom. Yosef, the floor is yours. Okay, do you, do you see? Thanks uh, thanks very much, Marika, for this introduction and hello to everyone. Uh, do you see my slides? We see them, but not in presentation mode. Oh, okay. That's... Is it better yes, now? Yes, it's perfect okay. now. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in fact, I will very quickly uh, present you with two uh, data services that were developed in the Big Data Stack uh, uh, project. One of them is the seamless, and the second one is the data scaping. The seamless, I will explain you uh, quickly what it is about, it has a single assumption, which is that data uh, may be modified uh, once uh, generated, but only to up to a certain point. For instance, for the Danaus uh, vessels, uh, the use case, uh, excuse me. Excuse me for this uh, problem. So, uh, so uh, for the Danaus use case, uh, it was clear that after three months, the data would not could not be uh, modified. So this is an important point. And uh, data scaping. Uh, so uh, the, the the problem is querying data uh, through uh, Spark SQL. Uh, this uh, technology uh, has uh, been uh, has been developed around Spark SQL, but uh, it could be generalized uh, to other engines. So uh, this uh, presentation, it is also an important point, is given in the context of the shipping use case that you already have seen this, this morning. Uh, however, uh, both components are completely general and may be applied to any data set or a, both for data scaping and seamless. Uh, seamless uh, only with the, the assumption that we described. So, uh, here we have a, a set of vessels who are uh, sending their uh, IoT data to a data center. Uh, this, this data is uh, processed and comes in within the database. Now, this uh, database uh, uh, stores the recent data that was uh, sent by the vessels and maybe 
maybe obviously uh, queried or accessed by many uh, applications, uh, uh, services, etc. Now, the, the problem is that, in fact, this database has its limita limitations. Uh, it could not uh, grow uh, forever in terms of size and also the price of uh, storing data in such a database uh, is quite high. So there is a need for, a, for object storage, uh, which, is, which could be local, uh, MinIO, for instance, or uh, could be also remote. We use also the IBM uh, uh, cloud object storage. So we have both needs. And here comes, uh, here comes the, the seamless component, which is in fact to present a single logical data set to the user. The user wants to query uh, the data set and, uh, and uh, in fact, the user will not know whether uh, what part of the, the, the data set is still in the database, what part is already in the object storage. And uh, this, it just issues an SQL query to the seamless component and gets the results without knowing the, the details and the, the intricacies of, the, of what's going on inside. Now, obviously, uh, without entering the, the details of uh, this component, we don't have the time. We need a mover, a mover which will automatically move data, historical data slices, let's say uh, one day of data, uh, which has come to an age of three months, is automatically moved uh, towards the object storage. And this without a... Uh, without, uh, uh, influencing the, the 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 qualities of the database, which are which is acid. We, so in in the middle of uh, the data moving, you can still uh, put your queries, and you will get all the regular properties, and also you will get the regular uh, performance. Uh, and this this is uh, the real nice thing about uh, this uh, component. And uh, uh, now uh, we get to the second component, which is data skipping, which is around Spark SQL for now. Uh, so data skipping, the, the, the goal of uh, this component is, uh, first of all, relevant for SQL queries. Uh, as we said, has been implemented for Apache Spark SQL. We are uh, up to date, 3.01 now. And um, this is a completely standalone technology, uh, uh, but also it very nicely complements the seamless component because now that you are querying your data and your data is staying both in a local, uh, very performant uh, uh, traditional database and also in the object storage may it be local or remote, you may feel some uh, discrepancies in terms of the performance. And here comes the, the data skipping, which permits to accelerate uh, nicely uh, the object storage uh, uh, component, uh, retrieval of the SQL from the object storage. So that's, that's, uh, that's a nice uh, complementation between the two, the two uh, services. Let's uh, just explain you in a few words how, how this uh, data skipping worked. So uh, the, the user is asking some, uh, some SQL query. Uh, it pertains to a, a full data set, which are all these uh, yellow uh, rounds in the, in the figure. And then uh, because we have done some indexing, some clever indexing ahead of time, we are able to skip objects which we can prove ahead of time that are not relevant to the query. So in fact, what is retrieved toward the, 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 the compute uh, cluster, to, toward the Spark cluster, are mostly only the interesting uh, objects in terms of the query. Thus, we gain in time and the, and the money. So this is data skipping. This, the concept is not new. What is new 
is that we have extended this uh, this data scaping to to a lot of uh, uh, of uh, new directions. We are able to uh, handle user-defined functions. We are able to handle a, a geospatial a queries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have even now the ability to uh, do data data scaping over joints. So uh, all this is is really uh, terrific. And uh, the result is that data scaping, in fact, is now part, uh, has been GA in four IBM services. It's also in, on its way to be open source. Uh, concerning the seamless, we have uh, now, we have uh, reached a working prototype uh, stage and the development of this uh, a very interesting component is going on and will continue after big data stack in a new project. So that's for my uh, very quick introduction of uh, these two uh, services. Thanks, Yosef. Then I think it's time uh, that we kick off the, the panel discussion. Can you okay. see my screen? Yes, thanks. So uh, uh, many are now speaking of data as the new gold. New gold, it offers new opportunities for business, but in fact, in the facts, uh, valid business insights need a lot of human and IT resources to be extracted from big data. So for many businesses, big data has unfortunately become big ad hack. And, uh, and this has led to the coining of the data exhaustion uh, concept. So we have the luck to have here with us uh, Celine Chu, who is a senior data scientist, and uh, Tatu Kuivalate, who is the co-founder of the Clusterbot company. And I would like to ask you two, uh, how uh, do you avoid the disadvantage of uh, data exhaustion? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, do, you do you want a little bit uh, introduction for myself or? Okay, so uh, my name yeah, is- I think, Sorry, okay. I, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's uh, it's uh, certainly interesting. <laughs> so please. <laughs> okay. My name is Celine Xu. I currently work as a data scientist lead at X Johnson Group. So as you know, X Johnson Group is one of the leading trading group in the Nordic region, which has seven subgroups having business in retail, investment, beauty, and industry product industry. So I have more than eight year advanced analytic experience with a wide range of industry experience like retail financial service. In my previous experience, I worked for McKinsey Shanghai, private equity in London and Hong Kong and Accenture Sweden. My Nordic, Nordic experience focusing on applying advanced analytics and machine learning models in customer value analytics, company performance optimization, including building uh, personalization recommendation engines, time series forecasting for demand budgeting and um, price optimization uh, and also uh, campaign optimization. So for myself, I have a passion to combine both big data and small data to generate actionable insight to steering the business decision. At the same time, building the scalable automatic machine learning we call it end-to-end -end product to direct improve the business performance or improve the return on investment. Uh, my team and I uh, is leveraging the advanced analytics and machine learning models to transform our group companies to be more data-driven and customer-centric. Uh, in addition, I have an applied mathematics degree from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, which is the second best tech university in China, and a MBA degree focused on digitalization strategy and financial evaluation from Cass Business School. Thank you. Maybe we can ask also to the other speakers to, uh, to present themselves briefly before we, we jump into the questions. 
All right, if I continue. Yes. So my name is Tatu Kuivalahti. I'm I'm uh, been working now for six years for Customer. I'm the co-founder founder of the company. Um, but maybe short uh, kind of history before that, I I'm like an entrepreneur, been uh, uh, kind of founding many companies also before Customer. So my first career was in a um, digital agency, or at that time we talked about multimedia, uh, digital media company, um, and, and that, that started already in the 1990s. And then, uh, then after that, I, I worked for eight years for a big uh, Nordic IT company uh, called Tieto. And then after that, I um, jumped to my own, although be like independent business consultant, uh, focusing on CRM and customer data. And then this was the, the customer bar was like a continuation of that. So, so what we do in customer bar, we have a SaaS software as a service uh, tool, uh, which we offer for retailers and basically also nowadays other B2C companies, not only retail, but the, we started from retail and maybe a short story how and what, what customer bar is, it, I, I, I tell I can tell how it's how how it all got got started. So we we worked with retail multi-channel retail companies at that time, six years ago, as a as a kind of hired consultants and developed uh, e-commerce and and marketing digital marketing solutions. Uh, but many of those customers at that time kind of started to open one of their challenges uh, to us that they have lots of customer data, but it's scattered around in different systems. So they have customer data in e-commerce system. They have customer data in loyalty uh, database in the physical stores. Uh, then they have a uh, customer service tools. They have marketing systems. So there's lots of customer data, but it's it's not in u- useful format, and because it's it's scattered uh, in in different silos and different IT systems. So then we looked at uh, tried to find a solution from the market to kind of uh, which would fit to uh, to kind of to these um, requirements to gather the data into one place, the consumer data. But we couldn't really find a suitable solution that t- at that time. So then we started uh, our own development work and, and came up with the custom bar. And then in the beginning, it was uh, meant only for retail, but nowadays we offer it uh, to any, any B2C company. So we also have many, uh, for example, restaurant chains and and some other type of service businesses as our customers. But the, but the challenge is the, still the same, the same, and and we are still solving the same problem: gathering all the customer touchpoint data from the customer journey from all different systems into one place, and to make it actionable, uh, to be used for marketing automation. So the other side of customer is then the marketing automation and triggering customer communications to different channels. We do also have some like product recommendation uh, capabilities there, uh, but yeah. But I, what 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 Celine talked uh, told about her passion. So I think I I could I couldn't agree more about my passion as well to kind of get the data into useful format and make it actionable for the for our customers. That's 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 my passion as well. So yeah, maybe that's a short introduction. Okay, um, I'm Ray Walsh. Uh, thanks, Marika and, and Josef. Um, my background is originally, um, I was an electronic engineer, that's my, that was my primary degree. Um, but I've uh, moved on in various directions, working for various companies. Uh, it's uh, Siemens, Siemens, Nixdorf, Ericsson's over the years, and eventually landed in the, in the university here uh, in a, to, after a circuitous route. And I've been working for the last 23 years in emerging technologies and um, uh, in particular emerging technology standardization. So for, for a long, long time now, I've been working on uh, standardization with at international level with the European Commission, with ISO, with IEC, with ITU, with, the, with Etsy, and Senelec, World Economic Forum, United Nations, and in areas like cloud computing, big data, smart cities, AI, uh, IoT. And um, I not only uh, evangelize about standardization and, and uh, the emerging technologies like AI, big data, what they can contribute in terms of um, economic benefits and not just to, 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 uh, to uh, individual 
businesses, but but to to complete economies, uh, to regions, and and globally to to global uh, GDP. Um, and then on, from a side point of view, about the actual impact of of big data, AI, um, in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's it's quite important what we can do with these with these uh, platforms when we when we turn them towards um, and the grand challenges. Um, and just to be brief, because I want to leave most time for, for discussion for the further questions, uh, um, I'm, my role here in, within EPDBF is I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the leads on the track, so on track two and on the trust plat uh, platforms, uh, technology and trust. Um, and I'm running sessions on standards, uh, standards related to economic growth in the digital single market and also on the future foresight exercises related, related, related to uh, interoperability um, and standardization for AI, robotics and, and data, uh, say taking a 2030 uh, long-term view of it. And that will do for me for the time being. Thanks, Marika. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm a senior researcher at uh, the Danaos Research Center and uh, director of development at Deep Sea Technologies. Deep Sea Technologies in, is a spin off uh, of uh, the Danaos Corporation. Um, what we basically do is um, provide solutions for. Uh, vessel for real-time vessel monitoring uh, enhanced by artificial intelligence. Uh, my background is uh, uh, I have a I have a, a, a bachelor in computer science, uh, a master's degree in information systems and, uh, and a PhD in uh, operations research and decision support systems. I've participated in uh, many European research projects. Uh, not only in the university, but also in uh, the Danaos, uh, in, in, in the Danaos uh, Research Center. Um, yeah, that would be all from my part. Uh, as Ray said, uh, it's better if we save some time for questions. Thanks uh, for, all, for this brief uh, 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 presentation of your, your passions and your, your profile. Uh, Yusuf, I think we can, we can move to the first question. Uh, maybe you um, you can uh, help our, our uh, panelists through this first question. Thanks. Okay, so uh, let's uh, restate it uh, more quickly, maybe. So after we saw that this uh, this new gold, this uh, the, the data which is the new gold, in fact, uh, sometimes uh, for many companies uh, caused a big uh, headache and. Uh, and the term of uh, data exhaustion uh, was coined. I uh, wanted to ask uh, both uh, Celine and uh, Tatu uh, their uh, opinion uh, on how uh, we could avoid the disadvantage of uh, data exhaustion. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, this time I go first then. So I would say the term digital uh, exhaustion can either referring to the undesignable leakage of valuable data, often personal, but also referring to the data that goes to waste. I think here we, our focus will be the data that goes to waste. Right. It's a good, uh, <clears throat> this is a good question about how to avoid. Um, maybe uh, the first intuitive answer is do not generate which seems not to really the solution. So when we actually see the data already generation uh, generated, then the question could be asked why this data could be waste. Uh, as I see, there's uh, five or seven different uh, like uh, possible reason. And the things, if we know what could be the possible re reason, then we can uh, focus on each problem uh, or the reason to solve it. Uh, the first one, as I see, is uh, the data is not accurate, which is linked to the data quality issue, which is not usable. Uh, and also, there could be its lack of trust. Even though they have good uh, quality, um, however, uh, people 
not able or not trust the data, so uh, they're not willing to use it. Second possible reason could be it hard to retrieve, which means it's stored in the same place, not really accessible, and do not have API easy access to, to retrieve it. The third one, maybe the data doesn't really have the right format and not able to be integrated with other existing data, which end user already have. So they save the trouble, they don't use it. Then uh, the fourth will be maybe uh, the, the uh, the user don't know how to use those data incorporate with their user a business user case. Uh, the fifth, uh, maybe uh, it's just uh, simply uh, the customer doesn't really know this kind of data exists. So the first one, I think if we have a really good platform and uh, have the authority mm -hmm. and can provide the single moment of the truth and the multiple perspective, then people will more willing to use it. The second one is if we have the platform, have a good efficiency storage and provide easy access and pre-access um, process. For example, if that is the JSON file in the system for storage, maybe you have the easy API to have this uh, table format transformation, then the end user will more willing to take uh, the, 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 the resource. Um, the third one will be the right format, then maybe uh, we could have the standardized format as the industry have and um, to give the user the guideline how we can cooperate in this format in their existing system, then we we'll solve the problem. And the second two, uh, the, the, the last two, which is either don't know how to use it or don't know it exist, then maybe we need to have some advertising or edu education program to help the people to know these things exist and how to use it. Thank you. We'd love to hear how Tattoo think. Wow, that was quite kind of comprehensive answer, right? <laughs> I must say. Uh, maybe I, I just could add some more uh, viewpoints and maybe some concrete examples related to that so I, I think that was really really kind of good over overview to the topic but then um, what i've faced concretely in our customer case is that since since we gather all the cost in, in our case we gather all the customer data to our platform um, and and make it kind of useful um, and easy to kind of utilize for the customers but even though it's it's kind of in their fingertips in so to say in, in many cases, companies still, our customers still don't know what to do with it or don't don't have time to, to utilize it. So, so I think one of the key things is, is related to the educating people, as you, as Celine mentioned, but uh, also educating the and starting from the strategic importance of the data. So, so it's, it's not, I mean, in retail, for example, custom, there is always a lot of data, but but employees of the retail company might might be kind of used to the old ways of communicating, old ways of uh, marketing, like mass marketing, or and not utilizing the data effectively. So they should understand the importance of 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 utilizing the data and and kind of of course it's also related to the competition because the competition is usually the best driver so so now amazon is is uh, rolling to more and more markets it's it's coming also i'm i'm based in helsinki finland so so they just opened last week in sweden uh, uh, ne next to us so so and and it's they are utilizing customer data really effectively so i think i think th those uh, these um, drivers are forcing little by little also other uh, and even like like smaller retailers to start utilizing their data because that's the best asset they have if they if they just realize it and and of course then they have to have capabilities um, to use it so that, that's 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 one key thing is this understanding and ed educating the strategic importance of the data then maybe another other viewpoint uh, what i could add is is then um, is to kind of um, visualize the data well. So, so to, we, we should give 
tools for for users and for for in in our case for uh, for retailers to kind of understand their customer behavior uh, and vi visualize it as as concretely as possible and i was i was thinking to give you even like very short uh, some example of what what that visualization can be so i'll quickly share my screen here Can you see my screen now? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, good. So one example is, we call it so-called 360 degree view of individual customer. So this is a demo environment of customer. It's and all, everything you, what you see here is, is not real data. It's totally kind of um, generated data. So I'm, I'm but I'm, I'm showing a kind of uh, imaginary customers 360 degree view, uh, which is utilized by customer service. So when the customer calls uh, the customer service or comes to the physical store, so this is the view that that the, the cust uh, we can provide for the customer service person. So um, so there's basic information about the, uh, this individual customer, uh, different like key numbers like how how many euros or, or dollars this customer has been spending so far, how many uh, times this customer has visited, and this is uh, a kind of imaginary um, uh, bookstore. So then you can see what are the top categories this customer has been purchasing, what are the top stores this customer has been visiting, and 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 here is also the personalized recommendations. What would be the mostly uh, most likely products this customer might be interested in? So so to kind of make it visual for the customer. So that 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 has been our aim. But then down here is is also the maybe one of the key things is the timeline of the customer uh, transactions. So here are there's lots of data now here in the, in the, the, the timeline. But the idea is that all the touch points of this customer. So what messages, what newsletters this customer has been receiving, uh, feedback sentiments from the customer, uh, tickets from the customer service. And then also, if I scroll down a little bit more, there is uh, also purchases. So what are the products this customer has purchased and from which channel? So you can see uh, these are from the Helsinki store, this is from the Stockholm store, and this is from the US web store. Of course, as I said, this is imaginary data, so they maybe not, not really accurate but uh, but anyway to visualize the data i think this is there's there's a lot of power in visualization so i i think that that is one one thing how how we can uh, this is also one way to educate the customers and users of the importance of the of the data yeah absolutely uh, thank you thank you to uh, Celine. you wanted to react no, I just uh, think is uh, I, I totally agree with that too. The visualization is really um, powerful and learn by example, then people were more willing to know what will be the benefit from the concept. Yeah, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, that there is also a, a, an important point, which is that sometimes there is a, um, a the, there is no integrated view of the data and what we are doing with it. I will give a, a concrete example. The data may come with a timestamp, which is, for instance, at the level of the second. And in fact, <clears throat> the analysis uh, will never get down to the second level, but will get at most to the minute level. So the, this is something which happens. And uh, there are systems like, for instance, Druid the platform, which permits you to, in fact, to squash all the data which is pertaining to, to a given minute into a single uh, data, assuming that we, are, we have the same, uh, uh, same uh, uh, values for uh, the, the key fields. Then it is giving you the average for, for this uh, minute. And in fact, it is squeezing the data in uh, sometimes very, very extensive way. So uh, I think that also this is a very important point to have a global view of, uh, of the data and what we are doing with it and, uh, and the implications. If we don't need an analysis at the level of the second, then just uh, let's, let's be happy with the, with the timestamp, which is at the level of the minute. And this permits maybe a, 
a 10 time reduction in the size of the data which is stored, which is a huge, uh, a huge benefit. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> let's move to, to the second question. Uh, it's more and uh, more rare to have all the data needed uh, for an analysis in a single data store that who was uh, referred to this problem uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, the data may be uh, in traditional databases, no SQL, uh, the data stores, object stores, whatever. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask uh, both uh, Statist and uh, Celine uh, to share uh, your experience with us on how to perform analytics over different data stores in an efficient way. So, so who starts? Statis, you want to start? Uh, no, please. Ladies first, Selim. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm flattered. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm thinking uh, all analytics uh, serve the same purpose. So either solve the problem, generate insights, or generate the actually action. So how to do the analytics uh, effectively, I probably want to mention three points. The first thing, uh, quite uh, intuitive, which is understand what problem we are actually solving, which data we actually need, and why we need them and how to use them. Uh, for example, uh, I was building the recommendation system uh, for our group company. And uh, based on the different target, the solution or the use the data or the data we want to use will be different, for example. Uh, do you really want to satisfy the customer to helping them save time for replenishment purchasing? Or actually the target is minimize the uh, company's storage in the shop to drive the campaign product sales. Based on what problem people solving, we need to retrieve the data from different data source and accordingly uh, use different model to predict. Second one, I would say, uh, when we <laughs> dealing with different data source, the most important things is to aware the different definition of the data across the database and also the coverage difference between the uh, database. For example, um, when we talk about sales data, maybe in one database is actually the net sales, the other one is the growth sales, then we probably were not able to join them together for the analysis and the coverage of the uh, crucial. Uh, the example actually we mentioned uh, previously about the timestamp, some of the database only have the daily data and some um, database will have the hourly data and how we aggregate in the same level with the right time zone to join them together will be crucial for the analytics. Um, and also uh, when we talk about the join, the join key will be crucial, uh, how to use it, uh, whether or not we will generate the uh, duplicate role. And also one of the example is OMI channel experience. Uh, it sounds easy to join the customer together but in the CRM typical system in the company, it's have the customer ID or anonymized customer ID. However, for the online behavior, normally we only have the uh, IP address. So how you identify the right IP address join with the right customer ID and still within the format of GDPR is actually a headache for most of the company. Uh, last but not least is a well, the limitation and the risk for different uh, database, I would say. First uh, is actually data quality. What I mean, uh, the data quality ideally in general is how many like new value, missing value, duplicate information, a different level of granularity. Uh, and also for different analysis, you don't need the same level of data quality for performance. For example, if you only need the report level, maybe 20% of missing unsignificant data, you could still have the right trends. But if you want to product, uh, pre uh, like predict the customer trend for each customer, then maybe 5% of missing the trend customer will make your model really worse. 
Uh, second, I would say the other uh, risk is we need to understand the limitation of the data. Uh, what I mean is, um, for example, uh, as I know, the tackle uh, currently do a big project about um, crowd analysis, which means they can identify a group of people, how they move from the city to city and where they're located in terms of improve the situation of pandemic uh, disease spread. However, what they pick is the mobile signal, which means if the person have two or three device, they will be classified, there are three people, which probably not the point. Um, the similar things exist in other like analysis. But my main point here is we need to understand uh, the possible risk and the limitation of the data in order to use it in the right way. So in summary, clear goal to write data in good data quality and the right integration uh, and a well the limitation and risk will be helpful for the efficient analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Uh, Statis? Okay, uh, I could not agree more with uh, what Celine said. Uh, I will start uh, by uh, her first point of uh, clearly defining the problem we solve because sometimes uh, we're caught in a situation where we solve the wrong problem. We have not stated the question well, and this uh, leads to unnecessary actions or unnecessary uh, uh, coding or whatever. Um, the se the, 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 her second point uh, was, okay, pick the right data for your decision. Feature selection. Uh, it's, it's a filter you, you, you have to uh, take into serious consideration uh, once you're dealing with, with big data. Um, so take, take into consideration what is um, purely ne necessary to you. Um, last, um, Through Big Data Stack, I had the, the chance to, to, to see um, uh, two components, uh, two technologies, data skipping and the seamless framework. Uh, well, uh, practically the data skipping uh, is, uh, allows you to, to, uh, to pick very fast the records that suits uh, your, your criteria because one of the five design principles is uh, make the usual scenario fast. Um, th th this is something that we also have to take into consideration, making the usual scenario fast. Um, and uh, the, well, the seamless, uh, the seamless uh, framework gave me the, 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 the perception of um, having two different data stores where the user can, does not have to know where the data lie. He just puts a query there and the uh, tables are returned to him uh, as fast as possible. Um, to cut the long story short, um, if I could uh, sum up this, uh, uh, my point of view uh, is that yes, you have to, strictly define the problem you're solving. Um, you have to, to, to make the usual case uh, very fast. Uh, so what is uh, frequently required is has to be performed really fast. And, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that would be all. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Selim and, uh, and the studies. Uh, I would like to move on uh, in toward a new topic, a very important one. Uh, as uh, we know that there is a growing concern that citizens, businesses, and the member states of the EU are in fact uh, gradually losing control over the data over their capacity of innovation and also over their ability to shape and uh, enforce legislation in the digital uh, environment. 
Against this background, support has been growing for a new uh, policy approach designed to enhance Europe's uh, strategic autonomy, autonomy in the digital field, and the notion of digital sovereignty has emerged as a mean of, of promoting the notion of the European leadership and strategic autonomy in the digital field. I would like to ask Ray, who is uh, among uh, his other activities, the chair of the BDVA standards, where does Europe uh, sit in terms of the digital sovereignty towards big data? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Joseph. Uh, yes, there's, there's, there's two things there, like we're talking about um, uh, digital sovereignty, but and for the most part, people think of data sovereignty. Uh, data, data sovereignty. And in, in order to have data sovereignty, we need to have control of our own data. And to have control of our own data, um, the European Commission has, has um, uh, recently, been, well, not that recently now, but, but GDPR, the, the, the General Data Protection Regulation was brought out to try and protect the citizen um, so that their personal identifiable data, uh, personal identifiable information, medical data, financial data, health data, uh, could be protected and, and if it was been stored, it'd be stored in, in a secure and safe way. Um, but because of, because the world is shrinking um, with, the, with the acceleration of, of, of the uh, digitization uh, of uh, industry, uh, industry 4.0, uh, everything, it's become more, I suppose, accelerated in the ICT uh, ecosystems. And we have, the globe has become smaller due, due, to, due to the, the, the emerging technologies. So it's, it's trading with, with, with uh, uh, industry partners can happen all over the world and they're at the end of a, of a broadband connection. So whether you're dealing with, with the US or whether you're dealing with China or, or other parts of Asia or Australia, and the, the time zones have blurred into one and um, particularly in, in the COVID climate, we've, we've got to a stage where, where everybody's online pretty much all the time and you're dealing with, with customers in different, different, different time zones. And the thing about that is that there's data passing back and forth all the time. And uh, as, as Europeans, we want control of our data and, and we want to make sure that that data has been treated the same way as we would like to have it treated within our own jurisdiction. And we're, we're, we're evangelizing that. And, and I think we're beginning to convert the rest of the world that that, that is a, a basic human right that, that you are entitled to, to uh, protection your, and, your, and ownership of your data. Uh, and we've seen recent things like in relation to uh, China uh, in the US where, where um, President Trump has, has uh, asked for uh, TikTok, for example, to have a, 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 an American subsidiary uh, so that they can operate in, in, in the US. And we've had the European, the European Commission, which has has raised concerns you know, in relation to uh, um, other other uh, um, uh, uh, 5G uh, vendors operating in Europe as well, uh, and it's all about uh, data sovereignty. So we we are getting there in terms of what the Commission is doing uh, in in so far as we need to have a standardised uh, playing field. We need to have everybody globally subscribe to best practice when it comes to data. Uh, we need to. Uh, and data, data governance, uh, data sovereignty. Um, we need to ensure that the international community uh, work together uh, to achieve standardization, certification, regulation, legislation with re respect to, uh, in particular, citizens' data. And GDPR is a, is a start, and it's a, it's a, it's a regulation. Um, the European Commission has brought out other strategies, uh, AI white paper and, and their data strategy as well to, to try and, and support this initiative in respect to the digital single market. Um, and also they, brought, they have brought out the um, open source software, uh, which uh, just brings us back to open source. So where open source uh, can provide some solutions, because if, you, if you're dealing with open source platforms, uh, open source developers, then everybody has access to, the, uh, to the, the, those platforms and how those platforms are built. And they can analyze them, take them apart and, and satisfy themselves that they are doing what they purport to do with the data. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, open source and open source standards uh, are very important in that regard. Um, and 
it, the second part of, of, of why open source not only would contribute to uh, data sovereignty uh, to allow us to have more confidence in, in, in the systems that are storing our data and manipulating our data, um, for, for, whether it's for data usage or for data sharing, we also have open source giving us uh, opportunities for, for faster standardization me me mechanisms. Uh, we have because uh, as, as the technology is evolving, using the, usually the open source uh, community evolves open source standards in parallel. Now, so does the international standards community, the, 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 uh, shall we say the big ones, the ISOs, IECs, ITUs, IEEEs as well. But because they're dealing with national bodies, national standards bodies, it takes a long time to get agreement for 28, 29, 30, 40, 70 countries um, um, to, to agree to uh, best practice internationally. So it can be a, a multi-year process to do that. Whereas when you're working with a, a collective of, of industry partners, that can be a faster uh, mechanism for doing that. But luckily enough, there are, there are past mechanisms to actually take de facto and, and, and open source standards and make them European uh, EN standards or um, international standards through ISO or IEEE also. Um, so there's the, this, this, this addresses both the, uh, the, the, the data sovereignty and digital sovereignty aspects of it so that we need to protect our own interests in, 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 in uh, and how data is uh, not just stored uh, what, what, where the jurisdiction is, but, but how it's operated uh, and that it complies with, with um, uh, European values. Thanks very much, uh, Ray. Uh, I would like now to move to the, the next uh, question. Uh, so, in fact, big data uh, has been uh, quite of a revolution for many enterprises. Uh, it entails uh, starting to move uh, part of the data, at least to the cloud, uh, starting using cloud services, etc. And I would like to ask uh, Statis and Tatu, uh, where are investments still needed in your industry sector? Status, please. Okay. Um, I will speak for the um, shipping sector. Uh, uh, there are two pillars, uh, in my opinion, that should be addressed uh, with respect to investments. The first one is uh, digitalization. Um, this includes uh, IoT solutions on board, um, decision support systems, uh, not only on board, also at the offices on land. Um, the integration of these two. Um, so once we talk about IoT solutions, so the big data issue rises. Um, also digital twins. Uh, Suppose that uh, uh, we have the simulation of uh, the engine room as a whole, and uh, we can change conditions there to see what happens. Uh, in general, digitalization ad uh, will address uh, the, the majority of, of, of the issues that uh, we face. Um, for example, during this period, uh, with uh, the COVID restrictions and uh, what happens in the world, uh, the situation for the shipping industries uh, were uh, very, very difficult, especially when um, maintenance issues uh, came up and uh, no personnel could uh, fly to the port where the vessel is and uh, address uh, this issue. So, this had to be addressed uh, mainly from the crew. Uh, so we had to come around with workarounds, uh, mainly supported by technologies, or even build new tools to support uh, these, uh, these issues. And this is more or less a, pro a, a proof of concept. I mean, this COVID period gave us a proof of concept uh, of uh, remote control and troubleshooting. Um, we were in a very difficult situation. We, we had to apply uh, remote methods or uh, invent new ones. So uh, without the digitalization, this is something that could not ever be possible. The second one 
um, in my eyes is uh, more important, but it, it can be uh, um, it can be enhanced by digitalization. The second pillar, in my opinion, is decarbonization. Um, there is a regulation by the IMO, um, the International Maritime Organization, uh, where we wish to reduce by 2050 by 50% the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, this includes um, alternative fuels, for example. Uh, this includes uh, components on the vessel needed to filter out uh, the gases, for example, scrubbers. Uh, scrubbers is a solution that is already applied in, in the shipping industry. It moves slowly. Uh, and uh, what it does, it, it, it collects the gases, uh, filters them out, um, uses seawater to clean them, let's say. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, the, the majority of the, of the emissions um, are either thrown away as a solid or uh, um, in a very um, small amount uh, in the water that is used to clean uh, the gases. Uh, so the, the, the percentage of carbon, nitrogen and sulfur emissions is, is, is starts to be reduced. We have a goal by 2050 to reduce it by uh, 50%. In order to achieve it, we need more investment to do that. Uh, and also digitalization helps there uh, because all these systems need a very strict uh, monitoring, not, all, not only on board, but also uh, at shore. If I could pick two, these are the, the, two, the two things that I would ask uh, for investments, decarbonization and digitalization. Tattoo. All right, thank you. I'm also talking from, of course, from my viewpoint from the retail and yeah, retail and software industry point of view. Um, so I had, um, yeah, so, so utilization of, of data is still quite early, or how to say, and not, not very mature in, in, in retail sector. So it's traditional sector, a lot of still, of course, of course online e-commerce has been growing now, especially this year, strongly in all, all countries, but, but still, still the fact is that maturity of the purchases is done in physical stores and um, and that data is not, not much utilized. Um, so there's lots of room to improve the utilization of, of, of data. So there's a, there's a big gap between the uh, possibilities and, and on, the, on the other side, the understanding and, and the kind of understanding of the possibilities for the decision makers in retail and, and also uh, the, or like all the stakeholders in, in retail sector. So, um, so the, I think it, it, the, if we think about investments, it, it should start from um, kind of and looking at long, longer perspective, it should start all, already from the education, uh, how, how, how much and, and how to kind of um, educate new people who are coming to the, to the industry, marketing people, uh, sales and, and executive uh, education also to kind of understand the possibilities and kind of give more concrete tools to utilize data. So the edu investments to the education is, is one important uh, area. But then then research projects and, and what, what, I, uh, what I'm looking for, and, and I, I don't see it much happening at, at least uh, in the context where I'm, I'm seeing things happening in, in our customer base. In, in different countries is the kind of very hands-on research or hands-on project between research researchers and, and businesses and then third parties like software vendors. So this kind of close cooperation to build um, solutions. And I, I think uh, 
the the big data stack is a, is a good example of that but but uh, but we would need much more uh, invest, invest investments to to that type of research uh, to kind of as i said in the beginning that that the, the global e-commerce companies are kind of um, pushing and coming to different all markets around the world and and it's it's really crucial for the european retailers and, and mid-sized retailers in order to be competitive in the market to kind of uh, start utilizing the data and, and start building their capabilities but but they, they are in the kind of uh, they have their own bottlenecks because they have they have lack of resources they 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 don't have much money to invest so in in that sense the kind of um, kind of um, this kind of um, joint investments and joint research programs uh, maybe funded by you would be really useful but but at the same time the content have to be really really sharp otherwise it, it and it, it should the, the kind of payback uh, time of the investment should be planned so that it's, it's as, as short as possible. So the kind of, uh, yeah, so maybe I'm just checking my notes if I had anything else. Yeah, yeah, I think that I have covered now everything. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Statis and Vatu uh, for your insights. Uh, I think you Mariko wants to, to ask the next question. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, so um, on October 21st, the European Commission approved the new open source software strategy 2020 to 2023. Uh, it's titled Think Open uh, and it talks about uh, how, um, how to, to improve the, the open source adoption in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and the governing principles that they're talking about is to think open, to transform, to share, to contribute, to, to secure and to stay in control. Now, our question is to how important are open source solutions in big data analytics? And I think, Ray, if you, if you can start uh, by giving your insights here, then Celine, uh, you can pick up after uh, Ray with your, your insights into the second part of this question. Thanks. Thanks, Marika. Uh, yes, uh, actually, in your intro where you mentioned control, store, share, like these are all the issues and, and uh, um, the, this is at, which is at the core of the open source software strategy. And this is very, very current for us because within Stand ICT, uh, which is the, uh, the Horizon 2020 uh, project with the European Commission on, on supporting standards development, um, a, we have uh, one of our one of our foresight committee exercises is actually looking at this specifically at open source software strategy and to invite the open source community in to do, to do a, a foresight exercise on looking at where we're going to go with this you know and it's timely because the commission have just literally uh, just uh, the week before last published um, uh, this open source strategy for the next three years 2020 to 2023 and uh, how can how can um, how can these open source solutions contribute contribute to the uh, the big data ecosystem? Well, effectively, um, as I said earlier, like we, I think that open source is very very important. It's it's first of all it it um, provides a a platform to uh, develop uh, much much faster solutions uh, because you're working with industry partners. Uh, but there's also the the element that we need to have. So, so that's that's the innovation. Uh, aspect of sort of the innovation li uh, um, life cycle, where uh, it's actually it's, it's probably not the innovation. If you look at the, the innovation life cycle, it's it, it, this is the um, I suppose could, could be termed the disruptive aspect of it. Like that, you get these open source solutions which 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 come out to react to uh, the the emerging technology of the day, whether it's cloud or big data or AI, it's, as the case would be. So uh, in this case, we're talking about big data. And they created a, a disruptive tools, technologies, procedures, services, etc., um, which shake the whole business arena up. And this disruption, disruption then could cause chaos if it just happened willy nilly, uh, and, and and everybody was at it. But what happens is that standardization, which is my area, comes in and looks at the, uh, the all of these disruptive um, uh, processes and says, "Well, let's have survival of the fittest. The best of you will become the standard." The best of you should become the standard, and will be and and once once that standard is 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 uh, published and adopted worldwide, then you also have access to uh, the vendors that that, that uh, adhere to that standard will have global market access. Um, 
and then that sort of stabilizes all this chaos. Uh, so, so this this allows for these emerging technologies, including the big data solutions, the big data frameworks, to come out um, and then to be adopted on, on on a very large scale. And then when we just when we think it's safe to go back into water and we have um, everything stabilized and all that chaos now has died down, bang comes the next big disruption. We start the whole innovation cycle over and over again, which which means that we're never out of business, which is cool because we work in the technology sector. But this is this is why it's it, the open source solution. Uh, open source software uh, and uh, it, it, it's part of what the commission uh, and the European community subs subscribe to that we, we're, go we're actually adopting uh, legislation to look at data governance access and reuse the same thing applying to to a, um, uh, AI strategies and data strategies European wide and the, the commission is, is constantly updating uh, the, the standard development standard development organizations through the the, the rolling plan of standardization and the multi-stakeholder platform on, on, uh, on a regular basis, usually by, by, by annually. That's it, that's it for me, Marika, over to Celine. Thanks, Ray. Celine, over to you. Uh, yes, uh, open source uh, solution is kind of interesting topic. Uh, I would say, uh, I can say there is a trend in the industry, which the importance of the open source solution is increasing. The trends uh, can be seen for, uh, from both supplier side, but also the end user side. From supplier side, as we say, like uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Facebook, even IBM are active, actively participate in open source community. And also they even contribute to their own open source solution. Uh, like Google, there is a big package called Profit now be applied by a lot of people using time series prediction. Uh, even like the big firm, uh, McKinsey, they also have their open source tool to help the clients called uh, Kenjo. Uh, this is spewed by their uh, substitute called uh, Quantum Black, which is an advanced analytic firm they uh, acquired in London. From user side, I would say, according to Red Hat uh, open source report, 75% uh, of the uh, sur sur surveyed company feel that uh, the open source solution is quite important to their business. And also, according to McKinsey's report, um, it called develop developer velocity, the biggest the different, the differentiator for the companies within the top quantile, which is, um, one of them is open source adoption, which means the open source adoption act as a major accelerator. I guess uh, this kind of um, phenomenon uh, due to, um, could be uh, due to some reason, uh, which actually uh, the advantage from open source uh, also. For example, uh, the open source analytical tools are kind of cost effective. And also you can do this try before buy concept. So it makes the develop process quite short and uh, the time to market is much shorter. Uh, second one is uh, it's have phenomenon about sharing knowledge. So it's leverage the uh, help solution for uh, the debugging for different uh, software or solution. For example, if you have the community, a lot of developer already use this open source. They already facing a lot of bug, bug. So they already have uh, the solution. So when you ask, you don't need to depend on specific consulting firm give you this uh, knowledge. You can actually just Google it. So uh, it's quite nice. Um, the third one probably I would mention is the flexibility for the integration for this uh, open source. So including the data collection, uh, aggregation uh, and uh, anal analysis. So when you, do, uh, when you use the open source uh, software well or solution, normally they have more uh, flexible um, connection to different database, to different uh, process or um, platform or cloud then you can leverage this convenience. Um, thank you. I think uh, it's, it's all from my side. Thanks, it was very interesting. So Ray, you, you really pointed out the, the fact that standardization uh, uh, in, in relation to also to this Think Open uh, report um, 
will stabilize the, the chaos uh, caused by disrupting uh, technology, th technologies. And then Celine, it was very interesting to, to see that you, uh, that, you said, that you mentioned that open source adoption acts as a major accelerating, so that the try before you buy, the sharing of the knowledge and the reuse. Um, so Yosef, uh, back yeah. to you for the next Did question. Yeah, just uh, a small remark uh, just before moving to the next question. Uh, Celine said, even IBM, and uh, uh, I've been at IBM for now more than 30 years, and uh, I, was, I want to, to share with you that uh, this is really incredible. Uh, that's uh, not a long time ago, uh, a closed uh, code was uh, the only possibility. Only, and now we have come uh, to uh, to a point where taking, for example, the big data stack where we developed the uh, data scaping. So uh, now the decision has been made by IBM, IBM to to uh, open source this technology, and most probably by the time the the, the project will be completed in at the end of this year this uh, technology will already have been open source. So really, this is uh, really incredible. And uh, this shows uh, uh, at what point uh, uh, all the industry uh, actors, uh, even the more most conservative ones, uh, uh, at the, understand the, the importance and the strength of uh, of uh, of open sourcing and the, the, also the fact that IBM is acquired the Red Hat, which is uh, uh, only uh, open source uh, a company, uh, is also a good uh, a good uh, point to understand the, the importance of uh, of uh, open sourcing. So now moving to a, uh, our last question. So uh, research. And innovation projects such uh, like uh, Big Data Stack have created and create teams where uh, research people, industry people, use case companies all are in a single team. And this has been noted by Tatsu previously. Uh, and uh, I would like to both ask Ray and Tatsu, uh, who certainly have a broader view of research industry than mine, to, to, to what extent uh, research and innovation projects such as Big Data Stack help to breach the barrier between industry and research? Please. Thanks, Joseph. I, maybe I'll kick that one off and hand over to Tatsu uh, at the end um, uh, of, of, of at least an introductory statement on it. Yeah, I, I like this question actually. And I, I just, when, when I saw it coming up on the slide, like and seeing this RI projects, it, it's actually more than that. It, the link between industry and research and research in this instance really is, 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 is trying to, uh, I suppose, is using the, the term uh, academia, you know, the, sort of the university research because research happens in industry as well. But in, in this context, normally it means um, uh, the, the link between the university research centers um, and uh, the industrial partners, both of which carry out in um, uh, research but only really one that carries out the, uh, the actual technology development, uh, which is on the business side of the industry partner. Sometimes you get spin-offs in terms of startups, but that's a separate conversation and, uh, um, to be held later. But I would actually throw in the TD as well as the RNI. I would say these the RTD and I, so the te technological and development aspect to it is, is important. And how can that? How can these projects uh, break down the barrier? And, and the answer is collaboration, and that's the whole, the whole raison d'être behind the large framework programs that the European Commission has been running for uh, since well, so since my engagement, which is a framework five, six, seven, uh, we're up as far as Horizon 2020 and very nearly into Horizon Europe now at this stage. And billions and billions of euro have been spent on exactly this, to get the best of the best to collaborate on research, technology, development, and innovation. So from industry, from academia, from stakeholders from, from uh, everywhere. So sometimes it's governments, sometimes it's it's charities, uh, sometimes there's social communities involved. You know, this is this it's the collaboration 
um, that that makes for these things to work. And uh, academia, at least myself, would be forced to say, well, I don't do the business element element of this well, like we I mean, do research and uh, and uh, so a little bit of, R, of of D. So a lot of big R and small D, but but industry do big D and and small R. And then there's a hybrid somewhere in, in between, which do a bit, of, a bit of both. But if you want the best researchers, the best technologists, the best developers, and the best innovators together, you, you need to put them together in, 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 in this hot sauce, like big data stack, which will, which will generate real change, uh, new platforms, um, new solutions, uh, and, uh, and bring the whole industry um, uh, forward with them in, 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 in lockstep, because there's so many stakeholders involved. And if they're doing this, as part of a funded project, they, they, there's a little bit of, of uh, um, uh, there's a risk mitigation there because the commission is supporting some of the development and the, and the research and the innovation, but they're also putting both sides, the, the uh, industry and, and the academic partners are, are in the investing of their time and uh, uh, their in-kind contribution in relation to expertise, um, um, resources, uh, data, processes, software, sometimes platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's this collaborative environment um, uh, that the RNI and or RTDI projects, that I, that I like to call them, um, help to bid, bridge that barrier between a, a siloed approach in academia or a siloed, siloed approach to, in, in, in industry. Uh, I think this is the way forward. Uh, over to you, Tatu. Thanks. Yes, I totally agree. What I think from from the business perspective um, and industry perspective is the kind of there is um, we are kind of um, running too fast and not looking around for help enough. I think uh, and and help from research in this context. So so what 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 uh, yeah when I was thinking about this question I. I was, we have had some in our company, we have had few, maybe one or two research projects uh, within the, the six, six years we've been in operation. And, uh, and the, the reason why we haven't had more is that we should spend more time. We, we are kind of um, so busy with our kind of operational business and running the business. Uh, of course, it's different in if you have a like in my previous uh, workplace where we had we were a huge company we had kind of more space for pe and more people also who could, could just collaborate and build these bridges but but um, but i think this applies to many even bigger companies mid-size and even large companies and especially in retail because the retail is really tough competition business so there's not enough kind of uh, understanding of possibilities of utilizing research and kind of uh, stopping for a moment and just having that dialogue uh, more acti active. So it doesn't mean that we should kind of take half of our time and, and kind of focus on, on, on kind of co collaboration, but, but just having some time to have dialogues with researchers and, and uh, different kind of initiatives to explain the industry problems that we are facing in the industry so that and then from the research point of view is then that to, to catch those balls quickly and kind of start building uh, research projects uh, on those um, real life problems that industry is facing so uh, but but what, what i see is one of the the biggest bottleneck is is the kind of the lack of dialogue and the lack of kind of um, uh, this dialogue so where the industry would describe the problems or companies would dis describe the problems they are facing the, the these kind of research questions that that they don't have time to kind of solve because they are solving the daily problems and then uh, somebody from the research side who would take that initiative and start building research program around it or project around it so so i think that that's something uh, it's 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 both both sides of course uh, it, it it's, 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 it's required more kind of this kind of dialogue. I can I come back on that actually because just uh, um, just to pick up on what Tato said. Like I mean, I think it's it, it's, it's uh, very interesting because um, we actually need exemplars, you know, where this has been successful. Okay, and the likes of Big Data Stack is is exactly that. Like where we need to we need to be able to show 
uh, other companies, other SMEs, uh, startups, like, you know, and, and, and established co co companies and multinational companies even that look, this is what you get, you know, when you take that leap of faith and, and, and try and do some bit of research, bit of innovation, bit of technology development, you know, and, 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 and uh, uh, this, these exemplars like will, will, I think, bring down the barrier to, to the engagement of, the, of that community with, you know, um, uh, European Commission for the projects and, and large scale projects. And actually, when I was just thinking, it just popped into my head because there's three examples that off the top of my head I can think of in relation to companies who started developing standards, you know, which is like an international thing, you know, uh, at the very same time as they developed their technology. Um, and got into partnership as well from, from the word go. There's three, three different companies who have done really well for themselves and they're the exemplars that I trot out. So we have DecaWave and we have OpenNet and we have Teodlas in Ireland, you know, and they went from startup to, you know, multi-million dollar companies like because they took that leap of faith, spent a little bit of time um, trying to develop, co-develop their technology also to try and drive the standard worldwide at the same time as 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 uh, innovating with research projects so sharing the not sharing the sharing the burden i suppose by saying look i get in we, we we'll share our expertise with some other expertise which comes from this different areas maybe academic areas or maybe other industry partners etc and we'll build out the company doing that and the three those three exemplars uh, show how successful that that process can be really interesting to hear thank you Back to you, Yosef. Okay, I, I, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists for their very nice insights. It was, I think, a very good uh, discussion. Uh, Marika, what's, uh, what's the next uh, step? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Yosef. Thanks all the panelists for your, for your wonderful insights. They're, they're really useful for us also uh, in, in our big data sec reporting that we will do so that also the commission will see that so the, the, those insights will will have further further uptake um for now i wanted to to see if i mean the the title of this discussion is big data the real future of emerging business i wanted to ask you if you could all formulate a one takeaway uh in sort of a conclusion for this uh, this kind of almost rhetoric question um from your point of view um so Maybe Celine, you could you can start with like one phrase: uh, Is big data the real future of emerging business? Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I would say just to repeat what you said: uh, the big data will help a lot about emerging business. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Tatu, do you want to go next? Tattoo is on mute. I think you're you're muted. Sorry, was it was the question the key takeaway? Yeah, so the key takeaway of yeah. is big data the real future of emerging business? Yes, um, yes, I, I, yeah. For me, I, the the big data. Yeah, I, I absolutely. This uh, I'm just stuck stuck with the with the term big data and, and started to think about the terminology but anyway yes I, I i believe that utilizing large amounts of data definitely definitely there's the future in in uh, for many or most of the industries i would say and um yeah uh, i this this has been a good reminder for me to kind of activate be more active in uh, in terms of collaboration towards the different stakeholders holders but especially towards the research thanks that's a ray do you want to go next Yes, yeah, sure. Um, well, look, as far as I'm concerned, the digital transformation has happened. It's been accelerated by COVID-19. Uh, we're, 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 you can see this is, this is, this is a, an exemplar of exactly what's happened. We're all sitting in, in our offices. Some of us actually are in our offices. Some of us are at home. Actually, most of us are at home. Uh, due to what, what's happened. So this digital acceleration has, has, has been accelerated through um, Reasons not beyond uh, beyond our control, and so this transformation has happened all over the, all over the world. It, it's been uh, instantaneous, and um, uh, so and then in relation to big data, there is uh, there's there's no small data, there's no AI data, there's no IoT data, there's no there is data, 
okay? And data is everywhere. And we need to get on board as to how to protect it, how to standardize it, how to, to govern it properly. You to get legislation, uh, standardization, certification, um, and certification to support us in doing our everyday lives so that it protects the, the rights of citizens and um, uh, provides us with, with in new challenges, uh, but also new opportunities, new businesses, new ways of, of, um, of generating revenue for, from, the, from the business sector, but also new ways of solving societal problems, environmental problems, and technological problems going forward. Thanks, Ray, very inspiring. Um, Statis, do you want to go last? Yes. Um, my answer is uh, apparently yes, I could not disagree that uh, big data is the future of emerging businesses. Um, the thing is to turn, uh, you know, data into actionable information because ignorance uh, and over information is, uh, are the, the, the two sides of the same coin. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, big data indeed uh, um, opened our eyes to options that we didn't know we had uh, so far. So I don't see why big data uh, is, is not the future. Perfect. Thank you. Then. Uh, we are uh, almost fi finishing uh, this, this really engaging and final workshop of, uh, of Big Data Sec. We have four more minutes to, uh, to finalize, but I wanted to give uh, the people on the audience the opportunity also to ask pressing questions to our, uh, to our speakers, both uh, speakers that we had in the morning, uh, our uh, Big Data Sec experts from the use cases, uh, Demos, uh, the technical coordinator of the project, also to Yusuf uh, and to our four speakers now uh, from the panel. Andrea, do you know if there's any questions? Thank you, Malik. So uh, we don't have any questions, to be honest. We have uh, very few aficionados <laughs> that stay till the end. Uh, but I think that, yeah, uh, everything has been impressive. I mean, we have a very extremely good and engaging session. All our speakers provided with them. Uh, exceptional information and standpoints from their own experiences. Uh, yeah, I think that our audience, I mean, has been completely satisfied with what they heard. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then, uh, then I want to thank all our speakers again. Thank you so much for uh, for your insights. Thanks for your your energy in in bringing up, in sharing your your knowledge and your expertise uh, with us. Um, We'll, uh, we'll close the, the session here by the, um, the recordings will be available uh, afterwards as well as the slides. Um, thank you again and uh, wishing you a very nice uh, rest of the EBDVF conference. I think this is the last afternoon, so there are still some interesting sessions to, to join. Thanks a lot. Say thank you, Marika, and to, to Josef for moderating and for Andrea for inviting us. Uh, it's been a, a really good session. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.